Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final panel discussion of the Global Breakthrough Energy Conference, Great Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference of 2016. We are presenting here tonight to answer your questions. We've had our opportunity to speak. We've had our opportunities to express what we wanted to express. Now it's your opportunity to ask us what you want to know. We have Mike Waters. Ken Rolla has joined us again. Our host, your own. This is his brainchild. He's going to be joining us representing BEM. Oh. Ruben Langdon is joining us, apparently. <laughs> and, of course, Marco Roden. This is a bus stop, isn't it? It is a bus, and the bus will pick us up later. But first, we're going to talk about things, if that's OK. All right. So we're going to tr stick to a format. Once again, I love to follow the rules. And we're going to stick to a format, three to five minutes each question, and then we're going to have responses. Some questions will be specifically asked to specific individuals, and some will be open for group discussion. So who, are there any questions from the audience that, that they would like to lead out with? All right, I see a hand in the back. Uh, you just shout it out and I'll repeat it. Wonderful question. If we could pick one thing weird, wonderful, amazing that has struck us in our lives that we have not mentioned in our presentations up to this point. Um, can we share it with the audience at this time? So, any volunteers? Uh, I'd love to on start that. on that one. All right. Um, <laughs> because uh, you're probably wondering why I'm up here, but uh, something weird and wonderful and exciting for me that got me into all this was an experience I had with uh, seeing an extra, what I claim to be an extraterrestrial vehicle. Um, it could have been terrestrial, I don't know, but from the many, many testimonies that we've had from online and over the years, <clears throat> it uh, I sort of made the extraterrestrial connection. I followed that lead, and that's what got me into discovering the idea of free energy or uh, abnormal technologies, exotic technologies, and. Um, I was supposed to present here, and it was some part of my presentation was going to be on that subject matter. So uh, I think it was something that was sort of left out of a lot of the presentation, but definitely something to be mentioned. Uh, I, the term extraterrestrial came up a couple times, but nobody really went into it. But I do think there is a correlation, a connection, and we can sort of follow that rabbit hole and then bring in some of the discoveries from uh, exotic technologies from our extraterrestrial families, and uh, I've been privy to have done that a little bit on, on my end, and uh, un I was unable to present, I, I apologize, but there's some cool stuff out there, and it's from out of this world. I have a very related experience. I have to say the most weird, for sure, in my lifetime and wonderful an informative experience has been extraterrestrial contact. I actually, for a few years, had telepathic contact with some reptilian and some other extraterrestrials, and I said, well, you know, if I'm not just crazy and this is all in my head, then I've got to meet you physically. And um, I demanded that for a few years, and they kept refusing, saying that our DNA has been programmed to fear them, and it would thwart the work that they wanted to do with me, et cetera, et cetera. And so eventually, though, I pressed on and did encounter them in the physical. I didn't touch them, but I saw them, three very large reptilians. They were benevolent. They weren't uh, the typical stories that you hear. And I had a witness with me, too. So that, for sure, I've been getting a lot of downloads that have, back in the day, I, I, you know, I was a computer programmer. I had nothing to do with any of this stuff. And they were giving me all these downloads and information about a lot of the technologies that I'm making now. And at the time, I had no idea why they were telling me about, for example, monoatomic gold and how ETs use them, these interdimensional beings use them. So for sure, that's 
That's definitely the weirdest and in most interesting, I think, experience that uh, particularly has to do with what I'm doing nowadays. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to keep it closer to home for myself. Uh, uh, what, what, what is really exciting for me is that, that uh, although it seems uh, far away, uh, uh, it seems that uh, 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 the suppression is so, so, so tight that we can't get out of it. I know one thing for sure, that I'm going to live it out, that that, that change is going to come. And for me, that is really exciting. If, if you see that humanity has been suppressed for thousands of years, and that we live in a time that that, that things are really going to change, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and that we're going to be a part of it. And uh, that keeps me going, because if, if there was really no hope, then we wouldn't sit here. I think, uh, I think it's not naive that we sit here. I think we really sense that change is coming. Now, the, the bad part can be, it can take another five years maybe, but it is coming. But it can also be coming next month. And uh, uh, what's also exciting for me is that uh, everybody has their theory what's going to happen or what's going to trigger it. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, uh, it's going to be something unexpected that nobody may be thought of. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, again, I'm excited to be alive in this time and uh, I'm looking forward to it, to, to, to finally uh, have some peace and, and, and spend our time in a different way that we can be creative with each other. And uh, we don't have to struggle so much uh, and, and fight the machine. So uh, that's my two cents of thought. Thank you. Dave, <clears throat> I'm dense. What was the question? <laughs> what is the most wonderful It's not what you, I'm not going to address to the topic. It's actually my uh, relationships with my, uh, the women in my life. That's the most weirdest and wonderful. I'm serious. The fact that That's they can, hmm? That's valid. <clears throat> they can bounce something back at me. I've learned more. The fact that I'm, the fact that when I'm so tired that I can't read out loud to them and I'm passing out and I don't even, that they'll take the time and read to me so that I can, in my state of unconsciousness, passing into oblivion, deepen and learn and still listen and be soothed and, um, and be inspired and have insights. So it's actually getting <clears throat> their spin, their insights, their takes, their enthusiasm, their em impassionment, their love. Um, I'm, I'm very, uh, it's, the fact is that I, uh, that I can sometimes rest and, and receive and actually uh, savor and connoisseur and appreciate it, because it's very hard. You're not going to find it on NBC or CBS. <laughs> so, um, so I'm. I've, I, to be able to experience contentment is a real tough one. And I can say that I have experienced contentment at certain moments in my life. And that's surprising. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> no, let me think. <clears throat> I think for me it's been the um, awareness of so many coincidences over the last, uh, accelerating coincidences over the last 10, 15 years where um, I started out looking at it more from, I guess, a more of a 3D perspective and 
the, the sheer number of things that have happened that I can't possibly explain other than there's an incredible purpose to what's happening where we're part of something that needs to happen and we're supposed to come together. It's kind of a feeling of family, um, almost like we've done this before, you know, maybe planetary janitors. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, here's one weird thing. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I saw a UFO once, which was interesting. But... Um, Every single day in the last two years, when I just happen to look to see what time it is, every single day I'll either get 111, 1111, or some variation on that theme. It's whatever it means, either it's just your clock is that fine tuned, or something more important to say, yeah, you're on track, just keep on going, there is somebody out here. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's 111. <laughs> so that's for me, I think, the most amazing. As long as it's not 9 11, then you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Vernon? Well, I was going to say something flippant, but there was. An experience that I had working with the the perfect synergies of technology and spirit and for a period of about nine months um, I experienced a period of no fear whatsoever I was in a device and I came out of this after a, a very unique experience um, and if my first thought was the sky ever actually that blue, was, were those trees ever actually that green? And for a period of about nine months, I, everything that I saw, everything that I touched fit perfectly into that synchronous moment. And I had no fear whatsoever. And it was the most beautiful experience in my entire lifetime. It's, it's hard to describe. And what I became aware of was that we are not, I, I stepped outside of the three-dimensional perspective and I became aware that we are not, th not, not just cognizantly aware of it, but intimately aware with every fiber of my being, being that we are not three-dimensional beings. We exist, our consciousness exists as points on a wave and we are not that point. We are not a collection of points. We are that wave that stretches backwards into eternity and forwards into infinity. And if we can adopt that perspective, then we will never need to fear again. So that was probably the most profound and, and, and beautiful experience what I've ever had. What triggered it? I was inside of a device called the Stargate. Uh, well, that's our nickname for it. It's called the Celestial Navigator. It's a giant 32-foot tall octahedron with spinning tetrahedrons inside, um, resonant frequency devices, and a, a big, giant um, Tesla coil-type generator focusing energy upon you. So there was all different types of ultrasounds and different harmonics going on. There were harmonics, there were ener uh, there was etheric energy concentrators, and you are at the focal point. You are literally in the eye of the hurricane. Can you go back to this? Yeah, where can we get yeah. some of that? <laughs> I want some. <laughs> I want some. And now we have, oh, there's my time's up now, <laughs> so it's time to move on to the next question. <laughs> I do have pictures on the website, and I do have a book. Uh, my my uh, family wrote, uh, my mother wrote a book on her experiences building this technology. Everyone experiences things differently. So no, it's not a ride at Disneyland. We can't all go on it, unfortunately. But we can get there, we know that it's, we know that it's real. And um, like I've said before, I don't talk about theoretical, I don't talk about hypothetical, I talk about experiences. And so this is, this is real. So if, if uh, we can get there, everybody's journey will be different, but we can, we can be there. It is my hope that every single one of us here and out there in the live streaming world um, and the people that will eventually see this can live in a moment without fear. I, I would like that. 
I, I would like to add something on the fear part. Um, because it's one of the reasons why this field is not moving forward uh, with certain people. Uh, cer certain people, and, and that's not my belief, I, I think it's the opposite. Some people believe uh, uh, people get threatened and then they get the fear and they stop their research. Or, or, or some people got killed even in this field. It's a reality uh, uh, because they were working on a device or they were coming to, 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 too close to market. I think it works the other way around. I think fear attracts that, uh, uh, that people get threatened, uh, that they are being taken out. Uh, and what I propose, I, I get these questions, uh, a question uh, once in a while, yeah, are you not afraid putting on these conferences and uh, that they're gonna get to you? No. Not at all. Uh, I'm just doing my thing. Uh, I do it uh, w with good intention. And uh, I don't worry about that at all. And I think if everybody in this field would think in that way, we're going to be OK. We're really going to be OK. But if you're going to live in fear and in paranoid, uh, 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 and Robert also thinks about that, we don't work with you, uh, because it has no use to live like that. Uh, uh, it doesn't add anything, and it's not going to work in the end. So uh, 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 if you live in a state of just, I do my best, and, le and let's get to work together, uh, you're more than welcome at Global BAM. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I think about fear. Do we have any more questions from the audience for right now? All right, well, mull them over. I've got some here. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Someone. I can't see. Oh, it's like uh, when, when you. Oh, oh, I was going to say, just oh. like I asked Vernon, what triggered your view on that? You wouldn't think that there was one moment, but I mean, is it what, how did you arrive to that understanding? O of no fear? It seems like a silly question, but yeah. How come you are, you have what is called certitude, you have convention, conviction, you have consecration, you have confidence, you have whatever. That's, that's marketable. Uh, uh, but because uh, uh, I, I think uh, we really are creating your own reality at a level. And uh, 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 women like confidence. Now I'm interested. <laughs> that, that works. If you're confident in business, that works. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, use, uh, I think confidence across the board works. Right. And, and fear is the opposite of confidence. Right. So that doesn't work. So it's also in this field. If we want to get this forward, then, then you need to be confident in that we're going to succeed. And, uh, and it's not just the, 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 that I uh, uh, phrase it like that. I, I really believe that it works like that. And uh, I, I believe that if you don't have fear, then what happens is miracles occur spontaneously. Yeah, and, and, and uh, con in, in my way, consciousness, uh, con consciousness works in this way. I if you want something and you believe in it, sooner or later it's going to happen. Now, what we're trying to establish with this, uh, with this scene is something so big. It it's bigger than the internet or whatever we have experienced in life. The paradigm shift is so big that it needs a lot of consciousness from a lot of people to change it. It's not going to happen by one inventor and a lot of money behind him and, and let's get it to market. It, it, it will never happen like that. It has been tried before. Uh, 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 that, that's why I propose uh, we are working at Global BAM uh, uh, at, a, at a crowdfund campaign that has never been done before in a different way than it has been done before to get grassroots support for this because it needs to be consciously driven by a lot of people. They have to get behind it. And, uh, and then I think we will get a machine to market. So 
in the end, it's all about consciousness. Uh, I see a question from the back. Go ahead, shout it out. That is a fantastic question. Thank Absolutely. you. The question uh, for, for people out in, uh, in live stream land is, given all of the technologies that we have seen presented here today and this weekend, uh, is there a method that, that we can envision that would integrate those technologies into ex as, a, as a retrofit or as a, as a bridging from existing technologies, or do we need to or do we need to tear down the infrastructure and rebuild it with, with, the, uh, with new energy technologies? So anybody want to jump in on that one? Right, I'll start. Um, obviously, if you're going to be combative, you're going to get pushback. Um, sometimes you have to make a stand. But in this kind of situation, this is a transition strategy, and that's why I've put so much effort into thinking about that, because from one respect, you're going from a debt lack based economy to the exact opposite, we hope, which is an abundance-based economic system. Two polar, polar opposites, but you're going in an upwards direction, so you're gaining energy in a very real way. Um, there are strategies that we can uh, employ to start at the top down as well as the bottom up. So, for instance, take a coal plant. Um, I have a number of technologies that I'm either directly working with or know of that can produce heat very easily without using a conventional fuel source. You don't need nuclear, you don't need coal. And you can go into, say, a power plant in a case like this, which is still just a steam engine, yeah. right? That's good. You produce heat, you make steam, you drive a turbine. Right. The way we produce heat is the problem, coal nuclear, whatever. Um, so in this case, you can go into a situation like that and say, look, you're spending X amount of dollars on this, you're getting hit hard by complaints about the pollution. We'll bring this in, stop burning the coal, and oh, by the way, you have enough money left over, now of course this is during transition, <clears throat> to double everybody's salary all the way back to the mine pay them to stop digging. <laughs> There's still money left over because you have done away from your major investor that gives nothing, that piece of coal. He is an investor that sucks you dry, environmentally, economically. So there are ways to, uh, that's a very idealistic way of approaching that situation. And there are other lo lots of other things going on. But I do think that in most situations, you can find a collaborative stance and you can avoid the cornered animal um, situation, which entrenched infrastructures are going to tend to manifest. So if we're coming in at the grassroots at the same time and offering solutions there too, and I'm working with several technologies that are capable of doing that, um, again, if you try to take a collaborative stance wherever possible, I think we can minimize the, uh, the the pain <laughs> of transition. Do we have a comment or, Do we have a comment or a rebuttal or an? I just throw out there. I don't think anybody's mentioned this, but um, uh, flex fuel E85. All my vehicles run on converters. I, I've went. And I have a Toyota Prius, a Toyota truck, and a um, Honda minivan. And uh, yes, anyways, those three vehicles for now. Um, I, there's another car I put it on. Uh, oh yeah, a Fiat. Um, and you just go to flexfuel.com and you buy a converter and you can throw it on your car if it's not already f made for flexfuel. And you consciously go out and you seek E85. I know it's not 
the best thing right now, but it is a definitely a transition. You know, all of our cars can run on alcohol, and there's lots of information out there about running your car on alcohol, and it burns way cleaner. And you go, I live in California, so I have to go get emissions tests. They, they're like, you, I drive these old vehicles, and they're like, man, you've got the cleanest car ever. <laughs> this is, we've never seen anything so clean. I don't tell them what I'm putting in there. But uh, you just, yeah, E85, that's one transitionary thing that hasn't been mentioned. I just thought I'd mention it. Also, too, I think that the transition to these new technologies right. will, people will choose them as they become available simply because they're a better option. So it won't be like we'll dismantle the electric grid in one fell swoop. Basically, it's like right now, you can buy a Tesla electric vehicle for $35,000 now, and you know people are jumping on that, early adopters. It's the same thing with all these technologies. As they become available, then the early adopters and people will start buying them and getting into them. And I think that the, the people predominantly will be choosing these technologies and transitioning away from the old ones. I, I also think the opportunities uh, uh, business-wise is going to give uh, uh, such a huge injection uh, in society that, that, that people w w will come with ideas everywhere. Uh, uh, to start new businesses, but also transform their old businesses because they, uh, if they're smart, they, they can see the writing on the wall that what they had is not going to work anymore. So they're going to be forced to think different and to come up with a solution for their business uh, that can adapt. So uh, uh, when, when people are forced to think different, uh, uh, they will because it, it's a matter of survi survival. Uh, and people adopt pretty easy when when they have to. Uh, uh, so yeah, is it going to be easy uh, the transfer the, the transition period? No, uh, I think it's going to be a very dangerous uh, uh, time. Uh, I think then the beast is really going to show his teeth to us. Uh, but uh, yeah, then, then it's up to people if they're going to stick together or not. And, and, and look at the positive things, the opportunities. I think we're in the transition period. I mean, you, can, you, can, you have choices now. You can buy organic food. You can put E85 in your car. You can, there's, you can use your money and make all kinds of choices. You can buy an, a shirt where they'll go plant a tree. And you know, just these conscious choices are made being made available to us every single day. You know, one thing I just might come out of my field is you could combine two direct sensors. Oh, sure. And your airplane is transitioned, just like cars are moving from being able to be driven with a GPS. The plane is a transition to a lot of things that actually does go to ground. So it does bring a lot of, it's a lot of the things that we thought we think are on the forefront coming forward. And they are transitional things that put our threat. Uh, yeah, you want to? Th thank you. That's wonderful. Um, that was uh, Karen Elkins, I think, through the light. Yes, I think that's was. her. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was saying that uh, um, Mike's wind turbine technology and different techno and, uh, and and VTOL. and a VTOL device technology could be as part of the uh, part of the transitional process and retrofit existing technologies into something new and and, and beautiful and exciting. Yeah, I mean, I forget that because. I look at wind turbine, turbines as obsolete, but um, yeah, sure, uh, you can retrofit. But even more importantly, this battery technology, for instance, one of the ones uh, we can retrofit the existing tooling for lithium polymers with a much more powerful, much uh, more environmentally friendly technology. And we've got the more exciting stuff behind that. So that's a, a clear case of taking some, something where someone's put a huge amount of money into an existing technology and not just making it obsolete overnight. I think that's important. Awesome. My turn. If you like. Super easy. I did it myself, and I know nothing about cars. So, so, 
So he, he shouted out a couple of websites, permaculture.com and flexfuelinternational.com as resources for working with that technology that was mentioned to convert your car to 85. Um, I'd like to also give a shout out to Hydrogen, Hydrogen Garage, Intergalactic Hydrogen, well, that's a whole full hydrogen conversion, but Hydrogen Garage and different companies, um, we can all go out and, and do, this, do the similar thing. You could probably add those two, the flex fuel technology, to hydrogen and even get better. Even if you're not getting better gas mileage, at least you're getting better emissions. You are cleaning your environment on a localized area, and remember, chaos, order, chaos, and you're it's not, all a matter of you're perspective. Not, you're not putting money into the oil companies. Yes. You're putting less money into the oil companies. Less money. Yeah. Okay. Right. Vernon, before I answer, repeat the question. Just um, paraphrase it. Uh, the question was, um, <clears throat> do we need to, can, can we integrate our new and emerging technologies into the existing infrastructure as a bridge, or do we need to tear down the existing infrastructure before we see um, breakthrough energy being used in the world? Okay. So we're talking about hardware, software, breakthrough, energy, technology. So um, yell at me. Tell me what the most advanced machine is, the most important machine there is. Human in body. The human body, that's right, the human temple. Who said that? He did. He did. OK. So it's not some external invention. It's not the road and coil over unity um, energy amplifier, is it? No. It's the brain. It's our apex of consciousness. It's, um, and what is the brain? It's an antenna. It transmits and receives between all of us or individually or to God. It's for communion. Um, it's for divine guidance. It's for inspiration. It's for refinement, polishing, like virtues, morals, ethics, something I know nothing about. Um, so, so it's, so, We're all going to be polished like a stone in a tumbler. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, we are le reaching a time now where the number one headline always is about implants now. Right now, we got wearables from Apple, from everybody, computers. It's now they're getting implant. Now you're having uh, paraplegics moving their arms and limbs, and now their thoughts are even showing up. <laughs> you know, uh, so whatever you're thinking is, can, they can listen to, and hear. Um, so, um, so the coil. Everything's a coil. Our brain's a coil. They say it's the folds. It's not how much your brain weighs. It's all the undulations and, and spaces, the gaps, the crevices. Um, so anyway, I don't know. <laughs> let, 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 let me rephrase it one more time. <laughs> Let me rephrase this one more time. What, what, what would you say if somebody comes up to you and says, Marco, uh, 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 if your uh, Ronan call uh, comes to market, uh, I'm going to lose my job at the all company and I can't pay the bills anymore and I've got three kids to feed. Uh, what would you say to somebody like that? Okay. Um. I try not to be too accessible, but assuming they can <laughs> reach me. You gave out your phone number on the public stage. <laughs> no, it's a terminated what? number. Uh, <laughs> shut it off right now. Right. Um, 
I like that. Everything has its Everything is a shooting star. Everything, what do they say, has five minutes of fame. Um, I'm aware of AT&T 30 years ago, 40 years ago, firing 50,000 PBX operators in a single day. How many people know what PBX is? When they move all the cables around, when they brought online the new technology, it was an it was an immediate transition. What about those fifty thousand AT and T operators that had zero job security? Okay. So, um, I really I really can't wrap my head around somebody losing their job because and not having and having the rug pulled out from underneath their feet because um, I can't even con understand the mentality or the discipline that it takes to be responsible to take care of your family, show up for work on time, have three jobs to make ends meet, okay? Um, it's just too big for me, to be honest with you, that whole context. I'm really being honest. Um, the sacrifices that everybody's making all the time. I know why I invent and make things and use the rodent coil specifically as an example. I did it because of the fact that, um, for a couple simple reasons. I did it because I wanted to get rid of pollution. I wanted to get clean air, clean up the oceans, reforest the planet. I did it because of the fact that, um, you know, uh, the combustion engine is an infernal engine. Um, and I wanted to have something that was non-polluting, that's an exhaustible renewable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a little bit different, the rodent coil, because it's not a motor that's 2D. You can actually use it to lift payloads to go into space, but that's another story. Um, and we never talked about weight differentials or anything. But the thing is, is that um, there's a lot to be said to be getting off the treadmill. There's a lot to be, to be said when you can be thrown out into the street, into the curbside, and truly consider it a vacation, that you're you don't have to um, toe the line anymore. I think the reason why people work is because they, and don't become artists, um, and don't become um, um, pursuing their calling in life, is because of that fear, because they're cornered. Because, I mean, sure, we have responsibilities, we've got to make bills, we've got to do this and that, Hey, let me just put it on the line. The people who don't work right now in the United States are getting more in government assistance than everybody in this room who has a full-time job. They got HUD for their housing. Uh, you pay, uh, like what, uh, $200 a month, Section 8. Does anyone know what that is? I think so. The waiting list now is five years, 50, whatever, depending on what city you're in. Um, it's more economically feasible to be unemployed right now than it is to be employed. I know that's weird, and I know I'm being a little extreme. Unless you're the upper class. There is no more middle class here anymore. Okay, and the upper class, what do they say? They say um, under 10% ha owns, what, two-thirds of the wealth in the United States now or something? 90%. 90% of it, they own the wealth? See, I, it's too big for me, all this stuff. So, um, so the very, so I'm, I'm all, honestly, I'm not trying to preserve the status quo. I, I may love it, it may, may it be who, it may have created me, and it may be my origins where I came from, but um, so I'm all, uh, so there is no option.
but to tear down the pillars the, of, of, of strength that are keeping upraised, upraised everything. In fact, the biggest thing that scares me is if the United States government continues to be not versatile and malleable and change. I know change was in, supposed to be incorporated into it, but if it doesn't change, it's gonna be obsolete. So I'm all about change as fast and as quick as it can happen without any hesitation. Um, my saying, the, my banner cry has been for the t last two weeks, let the bottom fall out of the bottom, of the, let the bottom fall out of the bucket. That's my position. Okay. I do have uh, something on this, uh, talking about a real solution. Thank, thank you for that perspective, yeah, sorry. because it, yeah. it, it, it's, it was a nice counter We're starting with your house to where first. we're going. Right. So, <laughs> it's a yeah. joke. No, it, it, look, I thought about this for a very, very long time because, look, you could answer the, that question with, well, hasn't a robot already taken your job? Hasn't someone overseas already taken your job? Yeah. Hasn't a uh, corporate slash and burn already taken your job? That doesn't help. Um, I ended up looking at it from the standpoint of um, sustainable communities. We had all these people that wanted to go out and put up sustainable communities to get off the system. And I started to realize that with, put up a thousand sustainable communities around the world, have you made a dent? No. You've set an example, hopefully other people will follow you, but um, it's not a solution for the 99%. And so how do you address that issue, allow people to weather the storm through transition, which is inevitable, because we're gonna become more automated? And the ec nature of economics is going to change from the idea that you must have a job in order to be alive, do the things you wanna do, to a wor world where it doesn't seem to be going that way. Uh, you know, what jobs? So how do you decentralize your basic needs so that you remove most of the stress that that will create? How do you protect your family? How do you ensure that your, you, your family, your home, have your basic needs met? And that is actually relatively easy. Once you start bringing in a free energy culture, you realize that in an abundance-based economy, the energy allows you to create everything else you need, especially when you start getting into the physics that goes along with it, like rodent coils, alchemy. I mean, we're talking about a massive shift in where we're gonna go fairly quickly if this tips the scale. But you need to decentralize the basic needs as quickly as possible to make it through without a job. And that is actually something you can do at no cost. No cost. So that's why I'm kind of hopeful. Now it's still gonna get rough, I think, for a lot of people. There was a big article, uh, or not big article, a recent article about uh, Apple shifting all their, shifting like 90% of their workforce in China to robots. and. T tens of thousands of people in China are going to be laid off. And this is in the next couple months. Um, <clears throat> but the government has a plan to transition all those people, give them wages, and uh, keep them going during the transition phase. So it's already happening. Yeah. I have a warped sense of humor. That's right. They're going to transition them into the military. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Soylent targets. <laughs> We have a question in the back. Looks like Tom Sparks. Thank you. Um, so, so the question was, given the fact that a, a large, large number of the population of the world exists without access to consistent electricity, even clean water, and the basic necessities that we take for granted a lot, what role does the breakthrough energy movement and the new technologies that we've been discussing here have in um, getting out to these people that are in that are in need, and how can we do that most effectively? Did I? And to uh, to exemplify that, how, what role do those parts of the world have? Um, what role are they taking for us in getting that technology to the world? 
um, basically, is there, does their need influence our interactions, and, and, and if so, how? I'll jump on that one. Um, well, first of all, it's already occurring in, in different countries around the world. For example, like India. India, the Indian government has become much more open and friendly to so-called free energy technologies, and they're allowing it to be developed there now. And I think just simply based on need and expense, and as the control mechanisms break down, you know, we have to remember too that behind the scenes there are a lot of these control mechanisms and the financial manipulation is breaking down. The BRICS Alliance of Nations, for example, I think it's 150 countries now, are attempting to create an alternative economic system to the G8 uh, US controlled financial system on the planet. So as these systems break down and control is loosened, these smaller countries that have been under the thumb of the big countries increasingly out of necessity because these technologies are less expensive, sometimes very inexpensive and simple, and a lot of times average people or at least mechanically inclined people can build them, they're already starting to jump on these and transition to them quietly. Just because it's not on the 7 o'clock news doesn't mean it's not going on. The rodent coil is already in India. It's not that hard. There are more. There's industrialists there. There's there there, very competent people everywhere in every country. So, it's everything. It's every the processes. Everything just catapults, springboards, naturally, automatically, all by itself. Look at the growth in China in just the past 10 years, 15 years. That's, that happened overnight, it seemed. Yeah. There, are also, there are many things going on behind the scenes that people don't know about. For example, you know, I worked with Ewell Brown back in the early 90s, and he developed a method for, for neutralizing radioactivity. And I was in contact with a Japanese ambassador who was lobbying the Japanese Diet to do something about Fukushima. And so I got in touch with him and I said, look, there are 61 patents worldwide for methods for neutralizing radioactivity, either fully or partially, eight of them in Japan. Yul Brown had this technology. There's already a solution out there. The reason it's not being allowed out, or I should say one of the reasons, is because it would be the end of the nuclear weapons industry and the countries that have the nuclear advantage don't want it taken away. But you know, quietly behind the scenes, there are people doing things that we don't know about to change the paradigm. Uh, Cash claims that he's been, I guess the TEPCO is using his technology supposedly to neutralize the radioactivity in Fukushima. We'll see if that's happening or not. But there's stuff going on behind the scenes we don't hear about. Um, my perspective is that all forward progress in human history has been based on the cycle of being in homeostasis, leaving homeostasis, and our attempt to return to homeostasis. So that means that as a people, we are living in the Garden of Eden, and suddenly we're thrust out of the Garden of Eden through no fault of our own, and now we have to, we are suddenly cold and hungry. And so we have to learn how to cultivate crops. We have to learn how to make clothing. And so we return to that warmth, that shelter, that state of non-hunger. We're in homeostasis again. And then something will come along, we'll be forced out, and we'll work to return. And so as these opportunities present themselves, I'm a firm believer that the universe doesn't give you what you want. It doesn't give you what you need. It gives you what you get, what it gives you, and you are judged on how you behave with it. You are judged on how you behave with the knowledge and the abilities you have. And part of that is how much you are willing to put effort into building up the people around you. And so, <clears throat> as we, th there are a lot of people that are in a, are in 
di dire distress, and and I've actually I, a lot of the technology that I developed was actually for uh, First Nations people in in the uh, in the process of developing plasma technology, and so I see this. We have proper we have opportunities all around us. We don't have to go far afield, but there, if there is a vacuum that we need to fill, we should put our energy there to fill it. Help, help people return to homeostasis. Not stay there, but return there, because that's where our, our forward progression is going to come from. I would also like to add something. <clears throat> we, 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 are, we at Global BAM are not actually so focused on the technology itself. We're more focused on the implications. What's it going to mean? And, and one of the implications, what I think it's going to mean in world world countries, is they're going to keep their culture. And they're going to keep their culture uh, within their culture. Long term, I think uh, 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 people will not have a need from those countries to go all over uh, the world and live in other countries that are not their culture. Uh, so even these technologies are going to preserve culture in their country uh, long term. And I think that is a positive thing. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, we need diversity, but we need it within their own culture. Uh, it, it doesn't mean, uh, uh, you know, how can I say it different? I, I think these, these technologies, uh, uh, also long term, it's not that they're going to be developed here and be given to them. I see that they're going to do their own stuff when these things come online, and they're going to take care of themselves finally. Uh, and, and that is that is another in incentive for those people to stay home, because they want to stay home. Uh, and what's uh, uh, a little bridge? What's happening now in Europe? Uh, 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 that is destroying the culture. And I think these technologies are are, are going to counter that also. I mean, I mean, open system is open system. There's a thousand ways to tap the energy all around us. Um, so it's, I think a lot of it is just about realizing that it's there and overcoming the ignorance surrounding the denial of it. I want to point out real quick um, before we move on, this, is, this panel is really is amazing. Um, we're, actually inadvertently exemplifying some of the principles that we talked about uh, yesterday in a not homogenous, but a group of minds that are divergent but coming together for a common purpose. And this is really beautiful to see, because this is, this is really amazing to see. We have different perspectives and different opinions, but we're all presenting them in a cohesive manner and in a, in a way that people can resonate with. So I'm hoping that's happening anyway, because that's, I'm near tears, it's awesome, okay. <laughs> Do we have more questions? I thought I saw someone moving out there. I'll ask one because I know I, mean, I have the privilege of knowing what the people do. And I know that for you, it's not just the science, but it's the consciousness and the alchemy that happens within. Why don't you speak a little bit about that? Because I think Marco, you've been actually quite very poetic, and you can actually use your, your song into a huge crown. So, and, I, and I know that for you, your life hasn't always been easy with the question that you asked him, well, most people don't know what he's done to sacrifice to bring his technology and not to be brought. People don't know the question that you asked, is he's actually lived in the car and taken the opportunity to not be sold out or bought out. He's a very, very brave man. And so I just want to say that to the world, that Marco Rome has been an exceptional soul and not selling out and gifting the world when he has his heart and what's been gifting the world by his faith. I wish I could take credit. I wish I could take credit for my obstinance. <laughs> um, going back to the earlier question for a second, backpedaling, um, I'm being redundant, but <clears throat> my view is that technology is either going to destroy us, we're in the gauntlet, or it's going to save us. We have no choice now but to go forward. Um, there is no choice. And, um, <clears throat> and
and I, my observation is we're not even going to recognize anything, this, our country, anything, in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, we're, we're really ill. They're coming out with nuclear bombs. We're in Texas right now. They say the newest bomb coming out of Russia can devastate 50% of Texas. One missile. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's supposed to come online in 2025. Okay. That explosive power is incomprehensible. Now, um, I'm not going to dwell on it. What I want to say is that um, what do I want to say? The um, we're in another time. We've left the. We're not in the nuclear age. We're we're going into a whole other era now. Call it the. Um, the inertia ether or spirit or monopole or dark energy age or Higgins or God particle age or whatever you want to call it. We got to go up to the next rung, the highest rung. And um, in that era, in that kind of technology, we live right now with the combustion engine. Um, it's doomed to obsolescence. I'm still answering your old question. Before the combustion engine, we don't remember it, but cars used to run on steam. I know it's hard to imagine a car driving down the street with a steam engine, but that's exactly what we had. And they all vanished. And we're, everything that exists today is going to be like the wallpaper on the men's room behind the urinal in the bathroom with all those inventions that we couldn't even imagine. They're so hokey. And that's what our technology is today. It's junk. And uh, you just can't perpetuate it. You don't want to perpetuate it. You don't want to lend energy to it. And it's hard. Um, I know we're all dependent on the cell phone. And the whole principle of the cell phone is to radiate and God knows, there was an article just a few days ago, it's been called one of the biz biggest experiments in the history of mankind. I, I have multiple cell phones, so don't consider me an example. And um, it said they've unequivocally proven, now I'm sure we all saw it, that cell phones in their existing form, which won't last very long, are definitely, they've determined, produces brain cancer now. That's front page this week. So um, there's a myriad hazards and, and dangers. Uh, we're all, sh you know, um, we're all sleeping with the devil. So we got to um, refine and enhance and improve upon what we got because it's all poisonous. It's all deadly. Now we're going the wrong way on everything. That's for sure. My favorite pet grieve is uh, aseptic packs, uh, plastic laminar lined. You go and buy your um, almond milk in a tw 12 different materials sandwich laminated square box that you don't even know what that thing's made out of. That's <laughs> leaching everything in the book into your almond milk as opposed to glass, which is inert. I know I'm very, I know a lot of you couldn't care less. Um, we're drinking out of plastic. We put styrofoam in the microwave and then eat off of it when it's becoming a, a chemical soup cocktail. Uh, we're definitely in big trouble. <laughs> e e even the French government realized that and they don't allow Wi-Fi anymore at daycare or, or, or little kids' schools. So that, yeah. that tells you something. If even the government decides uh, that they don't want that around their kids. So uh, people who still believe that Wi-Fi is not uh, something uh, dangerous for the human health uh, uh, should open their eyes to that. 
You know, also I see right now around me, everywhere I go and on this planet, there's the old biblical parting of the ways. There's people who are waking up and shifting and changing and creating a new paradigm, and they are the ones who are uh, happy and healthy, or at least he happier and healthier. The ones who are trying to hang on to the old paradigm are the ones who are self-destructing and sick and in agony. And uh, I mean, I see this a lot because the you know I work in the health field. So, as um, somebody said earlier, you know, no pain, no gain. A lot of these people, I see this in natural health a lot. Usually, human beings don't change until they reach a level of pain that forces them to. Very, very few people are progressive with change, and so there's going to be a lot of pain for the people that don't want to change. But the people that are progressive, like everybody here and everybody listening online, you know, these folks are all choosing the new paradigm, and they're going to be just fine. You know, I'm, I'm optimistic because I've had various sources tell me that our probable future is, is pretty bright. It just, you know, right now we, we're in the dark before the dawn. But also, too, you know, to me, I work a lot with technologies. I work a lot with, with health. But to me, one of the biggest issues we have on this planet is mind control. Because part of the reason that people are hanging on to the old paradigm is because they're programmed into believing in it. And so for one of my quests that is, I've been doing for 25 years is teaching people about mind control and how to break it and how to heal from the effects of it. And so that's something that we, people who are more awake and more aware, need to share our reality with others, not impose it on anybody. But when you have the opportunity, share your viewpoints. And that is part of the way how we break this programming. So I think that's a, a big part of it. And it's also a big part of getting this, this spiritual shift. Uh, talking about spiritual shift. So this is my first energy con conference. And um, I thought this was all going to be about tinkering with electronics and energy devices and exotic things happening, which I've I've investigated and, and been around a lot of inventors uh, doing these sorts of things, but uh, I guess I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. But I am sort of surprised at the conversations that everybody, all the speakers at this conference, have have been sp speaking about. The key theme is sort of this awareness, this uh, or consciousness. Um, I, I like to say awareness because it's I think everything is conscious, but this awareness that ev uh, everything is sort of one. Uh, coherent and we have to ecosystem and we are sort of working we have to work together with nature and uh, instead of against it and um, th everybody is sharing the same philosophies and um, uh, sort of spiritual almost almost spirit well yeah very spiritual sort of uh, aspects and uh, I've thought and in investigating this field for the past uh, seven or so years I can I kind of came to the conclusion I stopped pursuing it uh, and trying to te teach or pursue and uh, get the word out there because it, to me I just kept hitting uh, a lot of brick walls and I thought that these devices this these um, exotic energies aren't going to come out until we do have the shift in consciousness and I'm seeing that now especially here at this conference that everybody is sharing this this um, coherent sort of way of thinking and, and, and uh, of, of uh, compassion and empathy instead of entropy and, um, uh, and discombobulation. You know, it's, it's all about working together, and that seems to be, you know, how these, uh, that mindset is sort of what makes these devices tick. Um, and it's about, you know, not exploding things into oblivion, but how do we make it all work together? So... I just, that goes, you know, to the last question, uh, my observance of this conference and, every, and all of you guys speaking and just hats off. It's, I think it, the, the shift is definitely happening. Can I ask a question? One, one second. Did you have any? No. Okay. I agree. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to ask a question about is when you guys were all little and you were little children and everything, what was the very first thing that got you interested that made you get to the point of 
point of actually being up there on stage? I, I was never little. I sprung fully formed. <laughs> I sprung fully formed from a volcano. <laughs> The question was, what was it that we, when we were little that made us want to be eventually up here on stage? <laughs> Any takers? Obviously, the, the easiest answer to that is that we were probably, you know, driven insane by something, and that's why we're here on stage, but. Well, for me, in first grade, I, you know, I went to first grade and I, uh, my best friend in first grade who I met, um, his father was a physicist and he was one of the developers of the semiconductor technology and he had this really, really cool lab at this research institute in North Carolina, uh, Research Triangle Institute for these, those of you familiar with it. And uh, right off the bat, we, you know, we got to go to his lab one weekend when the place was closed and he's burning holes through metal like big chunks of metal with these gigantic lasers and things. I just thought that was the coolest stuff ever. And I, after that, I wanted to be a physicist. And, uh, and then I, you know, I kind of geeked out. And this guy was building televisions in his house with heat kits and doing all this geeky stuff and you know, fixing cars and bicycles and all kinds of stuff. And I just loved hanging around that. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So that was kind of what got me started on it very early on. Star Trek. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> Who says I want to be up here? <laughs> it probably was something else, but... Um, instilled in me is um, I had a book on my bookshelf in my home when I was about um, nine, ten, which was, um, the title was, it had to do with uh, mirror symmetry coils for toroidal pinch and hot fusion. How old were you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. L little light reading. <laughs> little light reading. Well, it's, it's like a baseball, S-curve. Same thing. By the way, I will add something here that everybody's not familiar with. Um, we've, we're talking about toroids, and we're talking about toroidal coils. Um, toroidal coils, the kind that we're harnessing, that we want to work with, that the energy that we're making is not toroidal fields, flux fields. It's poloidal, P-O-L-O-I-D-A-L. -O it's late on the scene, poloidal. It's like 50 or so years old, that word. Toroidal fields are like this. The poloidal fields are more, they're always askew. There's never a horizontal, vertical, right angle. Remember, flux fields go in and out towards the center of the coil. Okay, they move differently than electricity, which is essentially filaments and S-curves and spirals and vortices. Flux fields are, are incredible. You see them going like this, but there's also um, a gentleman earlier called it nested vortices. I call it underpinning nested vortices. I could become a floodgate and just keep going. But the point is, poloidal fields are skew, but poloidal fields, poloidal, P-O-L-O-I-D-A-L, is necessary to create toroidal pinch. Sometimes you call it Z pinch. Um, to get that everything working properly together. Okay. You could call it coherence yeah. between the very large and the very small. Coherence is like a waterfall. It's, um, I call it harmonic cascadence. Sure. Um, the numbers and the paths and, the, and observing and seeing it is just stunning. It's just so beautiful. But um, it's called ringing harmonic cascadence. It's called um, um, coherence. Um, and it's, it has to do with, um, hmm, it has to do with the gyroscope. It has to do with everything working in unity and unison together. Um, it, um, it's reverberation because all the waves are passing through all the other waves 
It has to do still with particles on the z-axis um, and emanations. Um, but these, when you take grains of a sand and you put them on a bongo and you then play music to it, the sands make, they make pattern. And after a while, the sand doesn't move anymore. Okay. Um, Scott refers to it as uh, stationary vector interstices. And I think Tom Bearden's ref always spoke of, um, and I, I, we all respect Tom, uh, re referred to it as um, the scalars or the scalar waves, I think is another way of, to try and define it. And it's also called standing waves. It's also called nodes, you know, and nodes. And, um, and uh, yeah, that if you can get things where they're, where it makes a certain geometric pattern, certain nodes, certain harmonics, 3D. There's no such thing as 2D. For your information, 2D doesn't exist. There's only 3D. And if you get 3D, you're done. Because any higher dimension conforms or works. Once you're done with 3D, which is made out of mass, material, everything else falls into place and works after that. So you don't even have to worry about the higher dimensions, believe it or not. And, um, and so that, that harmonic, that coherence, three, is 3D. Um, just to be thorough, a sphere or orb uh, is referred to a hypersphere, and that is a torus or a toroid. They're the same thing. So a sphere, a higher dimensional sphere, is a donut, just so we're all on the same page and we all know that. So a sphere is a torus as a hypersphere. They're one and the same. And it all has to do with acceleration and speed. And as things go faster, they eventually form a hole through the center. And if you don't have that hole, the, the, it shuts down and dies. It incinerates. It burns, burns up. That hole's critical and tantamount of importance. I, I, I like to go on tangents. That wasn't a tangent. I just wanted to talk about poloidal fields. And those poloidal fields then create those holes and work with those holes and displace the conductors. And that's why the conductors have a predetermined pathway into the future. That's why electricity has a predetermined pathway into the future, which is called LMFP, longest mean free pathway of least resistance. Okay, which means your least amount of collisions, parasitics, which is then you get rid of friction, and anything can be is a superconductor, and anything is a conductor. It doesn't matter if it's made of electricity, water, a solar system, air. Every medium as it accelerates takes on the same exact shape. Tornado is made out of air. Hurricane, air and water. Uh, when water goes down the bathtub, it's going in a vortex. Everything, a solar system is, our Milky Way is going around a black hole. It's imploding, okay? All things follow the exact same pathway on the third dimension, no matter what they're made out of, because everything is a continuous medium, because everything is emanating, okay? And these emanations at a distance are still, everything's still interacting and creates a certain, um, through the cascadence, through the harmonics, a configuration, which we call sacred geometry. So in math, there's an enigma called the incommensurability of geometry. And they can't solve it, because they can't get all the ge geometric shapes to interface. It's not a problem, because once you understand that everything's elastic, everything's coupled, coherent, connected, everything's interacting, then you realize the frame changes, and there's certain frames, and that opens up quantas, and you don't get quantas without motion, equilibrium. Motion puts things back into the hole, puts the hole back in the center, because that's the axis. And balance is different than equilibrium. Once you understand that equilibrium has to do with motion, and it's not static, and that gives rise to what a definition of even a quanta is, or quantum. How's that for going on a tangent? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Thank you, because that brings it back around to our own movement here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, will, I, I would like to ask a silly question, and then, uh, uh, after all, it's my conference, so I'm allowed to ask a silly question. <laughs> uh, ba back to Star Wars. Uh, I, know, I know that you're a huge Star Wars fan, Vernon, and I, I was just thinking, uh, did George Lucas, because I think there's more truth in Star Wars than, uh, than it's only uh, a story or science fiction or, or entertainment, uh, did George Lucas ever express uh, what the lightsaber actually is? I is that a breakthrough energy device right there? Uh, uh, how does it work? Do you know? So a lightsaber was originally created... Oh my God, I can't believe I'm about to geek out this much. So. <laughs> A lightsaber was originally created as an extension of a Jedi or a Sith's ability to access the Force. And it was a device that used crystals and the, the Jedi would, would accentuate his chi and channel his Force energy through the crystals to create a beam of energy from with which he could um, m the manifest the beam of energy with, with which he could defend himself. So it was originally an extension of the... Of the of the, the power and the strength of the force wielder. And then eventually it became, a, yes, a breakthrough energy as they, they went out and they found these crystals that resonated specifically with them because if it, uh, a, a, a force weapon could not be used by someone who didn't actually build it himself. So eventually this, this led to issues and they eventually found a method of channeling and focusing, oh my God, plasma, through the force energy crystals to accentuate the beam and eventually make it stronger and stronger to kind of level the playing field. So there's my geeking out in sci-fi. And in my defense, Star Wars is less sci-fi and more space fantasy, if we want to get really technical with it. <laughs> I actually have a true Star Trek story that I think people might be interested in. Uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, I live in Florida, and there was a woman named Phyllis Schlemmer who died just a couple of years ago, and she was a really amazing woman. She knew uh, Andre Puharic. She had worked with him. For those of you who know who he is, he was a scientist who did a lot of really interesting things. She was very, very psychic, and she had had extraterrestrial contact. She told me she had actually been up on ships and had seen nanotechnology back in the 60s and all kinds of interesting stories. And she's got a book uh, that you can still buy called um, something like A Planet of, by Any Other Choice. I, I forget the title of it, but she's got an interesting book. But back in the 60s, she lived with Gene Roddenberry, and she was channeling this group of entities called the Council of Nine. And Roddenberry was taking her channeled information with her permission and turning it into Star Trek scripts. So there's a lot of channeled information in those Star Trek scripts. And of course, there are stories that, you know, Leonard Nimoy has had people come to, to actually different cast members that people would come to um, the Star Trek set and tell them that they were having ET contact in the dream state and getting downloads on how to portray their characters so that human beings would have a uh, benevolent view of extraterrestrials, but uh, Phyllis Schlemmer said that when Roddenberry died, um, apparently, uh, that I guess he and his wife, Major Barrett, had a lot of the scripts, or the, a lot of the transcripts from her channelings, and Major Barrett wound up turning um, some of those channelings into Deep Space Nine, which the reason it's called Deep Space Nine is because it was based on the channelings of the Council of Nine. So um, kind of an interesting little thing that you don't hear too much about um, where that information came from. But I see this in a lot of science fiction. I meet a lot of scientists and inventors and engineers who are having ET contact. And because I'm public about mine, which I can tell you is not fun, I've, I've lost out on a lot of opportunities and ridicule and all kinds of stuff because of it. It's not something that you do for positive attention. But you mean you're not going to be an FBI or, or uh, Apollo astronaut now? I guess not. <laughs> but, but because I'm so public with it, people will come up to me who are you know inventors and scientists and people that are doing things 
uh, and telling me that they're having uh, ET contact in one form or another and getting information on how to solve problems. So there's a lot of that embedded in what we're doing. Fantastic. Uh, Star Trek was my personal favorite growing up. Then I became a Star Wars fan. I believe that Return of the or Empire Strikes Back was the very first movie I saw um, when I was a young, 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 young thing. All right, so we have a very short amount of time. We have one minute each to answer this question. Um, what can the individual do to make a big impact with this movement over the coming year as a way to kind of take the energy that we're experiencing now and, and transform it, transmute it into forward movement to assist the breakthrough energy movement? Please. Uh, I, this goes back to what I said earlier, just uh, spend your money wisely, make the choices, know what, know what you're buying, know what you're consuming, and make the conscious choices in every purchase you make, and uh, know what you're putting into your body, know uh, what you're putting into your environment, and know where that came from, and just research that, and spend your money wisely. Oh, um, be aware as much as possible. Feel, feel your heart. Follow your gut. Try not to listen to things that don't resonate. And uh, also pass on, hopefully, some of the simplicity in terms of the explanation of uh, the energies we're talking about here. And don't let someone tell you that this kind of technology is impossible because that's just ignorance. I'd say follow your joy and that me that doesn't just mean, you know, bliss out and and just be happy. It means if you're not if you're in a job or a situation or a relationship or whatever that you don't like and it doesn't make you happy and full of joy, get the hell out of it and start creating your reality consciously. And then you'll be, you'll be happy, you'll be in joy, and whether you're making lots of money or not or whatever is irrelevant. You, when you start following your true joy, you'll have a magical life, magical things happen in your life, and that's how you change the world because people will want to know what the heck you're doing, and then you can share it. You won't have to proselytize or preach. Just by being a living example, people will want to know what the heck you're doing. And so that's truly it, you know, letting go of the fear. Years ago, I had lessons in that. I had to get out. My soul was dying in the corporate world, and I had to get out. And once I did, it was not easy. It was difficult to transition out. But that transition turned into an amazing life. I feel like Forrest Gump most of the time because things just fall in my lap, and I meet the most amazing people and have the wonder most wonderful experiences. So follow your joy and get out of fear. <laughs> it's your turn. My turn. Uh, I, 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 don't see, I don't see change coming from the alternative community itself. I, I think we're ambassadors. Uh, 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 we need to prepare ourselves for the moment that mainstream is going to listen to us. I think uh, the paradigm shift is going to come from mainstream. When they hop on board, that, that is going to be the moment that we're going to have a paradigm shift. And, uh, and they, don't, they, they won't listen before that time is there that the opportunity is going to come that they will listen. So, 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 so I would suggest that you uh, 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 stay interested uh, uh, and prepare yourself for that time that you're going to be the person that they're going to listen to when, when, when they're going to be ready to, 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 to take that message. And, uh, uh, on, on a practical uh, base, uh, 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 j just follow us, uh, uh, come to our conferences. Uh, uh, yes, things happen online, but I think everybody who was here, it, it's good to interconnect with people who have the same interest. Uh, 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 it's going to cost you a lot more money than stay at home and sit on the couch, but uh, uh, 
at least it's going to give you something back that you won't experience on your couch. Uh, uh, you're, you're part of something and uh, 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 you get educated in a in, in total different way than watching a YouTube clip. Uh, uh, if you watch it here in, in the hall and you watch that same presentation at home uh, on the couch, those are two different experiences. They are sitting somebody next to you who gives you a, a comment. You, you, you maybe uh, meet a new friend over here. Um, uh, 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 these things give you hope. Uh, uh, so on all kinds of aspects, it, it is important that the, the conference culture stays uh, alive and that we don't turn into uh, online only. Um, and, uh, and that's why I'm grateful that you turn up because uh, uh, you make it happen uh, that, that other people can see it. And uh, so, thank you. Thank you all. And, and, and thank you for putting this together. And, thank you for and, having that and, vision. And Ro Robert, my partner at Global BAM, and Sean, uh, he makes a good point because I'm not dishing online at all. Uh, uh, because I also want to uh, uh, thank the people on the live stream. Uh, uh, they also make it happen that we can do this. Everything costs money. Uh, uh, yes, we got another two emails of people think that everything should be free. Uh, 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 but uh, then I wouldn't be saying this, this sentence in this microphone if that was true. Because I wouldn't be here. Mm. I would like to say something. I want to thank Jerome, yeah. his whole team, and this incredible, absolutely unbelievable conference. I've been to a lot of conferences, basically from the 70s, and this has been one unbelievable conference. And Jerome and how he's done this under two months' time is unbelievable. Yeah. The, uh, the shout out went to Jerome and the crew to actually put this conference on within two months time span. And that's, uh, it's greatly appreciated from the people in the audience and the gentleman that was speaking there. That was uh, so, Jeff. Jeff oh, is that Jeff? Okay. Um, so thank you very much, guys. My heartfelt appreciation goes out to you all as well because I, I've done several conferences and worked in several different areas uh, in this regard. And this is, Amazing. It has been absolutely a joy and a pleasure to work with you all. And, and, and uh, before you answer. Uh. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should have the closing remarks. It's a little risque and dangerous. Uh, I, I know that it is already in the works, and I, and I think it will happen in, uh, uh, in the future, but I'm going to put the pressure on also, uh, 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 not in a negative way, but this is an open invitation to, uh, to Steve Ellswick from Tesla Tech, uh, and maybe other conferences uh, uh, who, who want to join up and do something together. Uh, because I don't see those other conferences as com competition. I think we should work together. Uh, it's too fragmented. I would like to see a weekend uh, 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 that two or three conferences are working together and, and, and we're going to have three or four different halls and people can choose, okay, I'm going to go to this one, go to this one, I'm going to see the rest online. Uh, I think it's going to give a strong signal to the community that, yes, finally there's going to be cooperation, uh, and no more backstepping uh, uh, from certain individuals who supported us uh, and now suddenly don't. Uh, uh, when speakers are not invited, they're not going to support you. I could go on and on and on and on. It, it looks like a society, uh, li 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 like mainstream society that we all uh, so despise. I see that in this field everywhere. And we need to step away from that. We need to close ranks and cooperate. And I'm gonna give, uh, 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 because I talked a little bit longer, Marco, y you <laughs> won't have a minute left. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> 25 seconds, go. <laughs> You're gonna regret this. <laughs> 
Okay, Vernon, I didn't know you were a big Star Wars fan. I mean, anybody that talks about this upwelling and it powers this lightsaber and stuff like that, you obviously are a Star Wars <laughs> addict. Okay, even if it's true what you're saying. You too, right? Yeah, I, I, I admit that I'm an addict of Star Wars. Yeah. Okay, so I have my own personal Star Wars story. Right. My sister's best friend, my sister's name's Allison. Her best friend was Carrie Fisher growing up. Mm -hmm. They even had the, their birthday party together, like their 10th birthday party wow. together. And we know Carrie was Princess Leia. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my mother had a gift store in Beverly Hills. I put in the sound speaker system. I was playing Down by the River by Neil Young after the store was closed after five, listening to it. It was Beverly Drive in Rodale. And who walks through the front door? My sister had a key. But Carrie and my sister. And I hadn't seen Carrie in about a year and a half. My sister was all dressed up, you know. We grew up in Beverly Hills. My sister only knew nice clothes. And Carrie looked stunning and beautiful. When Carrie was young, she was, and still is, exquisite. And you don't, her dad's Eddie Fisher, so you think she's an actress. She, as my sister propounded so eloquently, had the finest, greatest voice you ever heard singing. Okay, we don't know her for that, though. And, um, and her mother's Debbie Reynolds. So anyway, my sister and Allison walked through the store, and, she, and Carrie, I had seen her do a movie with, and I know I'm longer in a minute, with Warren Betty. And the movie was Shampoo. And Carrie's big line in it, to Warren Betty, he was doing her mother, and while the mother was gone, he was the hairstyler. Does everyone remember Shampoo? Nobody does, not one. Yeah, so what was Carrie's one line? Someone tell me. The big one? You want to fuck. She said it to Warren Betty. <laughs> Remember that? And I actually, her best friend was Mae Quigley, Bob Quigley, producer, Hollywood Squares. I knew her. His, May and me went to school. I, was for, I loved May. Anyway, May said that was the one only real acting role she ever had. Okay? <laughs> but here's the story. So my sister walks in. She had never seen shampoo, obviously, with Carrie in it with Carrie, they're walking down the, the tiles of the front entrance, the glass window with all the beautiful crystal and everything, and Carrie walks up. My sister says, Mark, do you know who this is? And I look at Carrie, and she gets up to me, and I say, you want to fuck? <laughs> and my sister had never seen the movie, and she crumbled and had uncontrollable coughing, fell into the wall, <laughs> onto the ground, and Carrie looked at me, and she pierced her uh, lips together, as all, only the most beautiful young girl can do. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, I just finished filming a science fiction movie, and I think it's going to do real good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we are... <laughs> <laughs> it's a wrap. You know, I'm just trying finding, finding it really difficult to follow that one up. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to wrap. Click. <laughs> so that is the Global Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference 2016. We are finished. And I want to thank you all for coming out here. You have been a fantastic crowd, a fantastic community, fantastic group of people to interact with and be with here today. Thank you for all of your support for making this effort. Thank you for the live stream people who have who have uh, taken their time to be involved in this. I'm just really proud to be part of this program. So I, I, I've got two short announcements. Uh, if you bought a ticket uh, at the door, uh, we need your email address uh, because you're going to get uh, the presentations uh, uh, online to be watched at demand whenever you want. Uh, the same goes for the live streamers. Uh, uh, they, they can watch the presentations whenever they want. Uh, the other announcement is we're going to have a drink in the Old Town Bar here in uh, Main Street uh, in, in Biastrop uh, because we need to get out as fast as possible, but we can continue the conversation over there. Sweet. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and yes, that, uh, that perfect answer. I love it. <laughs>